Hi, this is Dr. Tom Rogers coming to you with a weekly podcast of the Common Sense MD. I've got a repeat podcaster that's turned into be a good friend, and certainly he's turning into one of my mentors because he's a Stanford trained orthopedic surgeon who now has morphed into an integrative medical doctor. And uh, his expertise is just uh, amazing to me, and it's always good. He's located in Asheville, Tennessee, which is very close to us. You know, we both visit, visited each other's clinics and, you know, have kind of a mutual respect. I hope he respects me. I certainly respect him uh, for his qualifications. Plus, he's just a super nice guy. He's easy to talk to, and um, he has a new book out. You know, it's, it's, it's really um, interesting because he talks a lot about osteoporosis, which is a a topic that we're going, to, we're going to talk about today because it's so controversial. Um, for a guy who's worked on bones, who's put rods up on bones and put mended people back together, um, now he's really morphed into a little different kind of doctor, which I really respect. Uh, but anyway, Dr. Doug Lucas, welcome. Thank you for coming on the podcast again. I hope those that are here will look back at the previous podcast we did because it, we, we got a lot of good traction from that. And certainly um, your practice is amazing. And this new book that you have completed, and it comes out, I believe, next week. Congratulations, number one. I haven't written a book yet. I plan to at some point, but it's, it's a hard endeavor. Tell, tell me how long it took you to, to write that book. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tom, for having me on and talking about the book. I'm, I'm really excited about getting this out. Um, the book for me, gosh, I think I started, it must have been February. So not not that long in if you talk to people that have written books, but the book I have it here. So I have an I have an early copy um, and um, it's pretty short. It's 150 pages. And I did that intentionally because I wanted this to be more like a, uh, like a starting point for people that have the diagnosis of osteoporosis or people that um, have had the diagnosis and are struggling with not getting the results that they're looking for. I didn't want to create because I this is the way my mind works. I would write a, a a treatise on you know a thousand pages on bone health, which I could totally do. Um, but I'm glad that this is what it is because it's a, it's an easy read and it'll really help direct people down a pathway. I love that because it's short and sweet. Even though you've just been working on it since February, this book has been brewing in the back of your mind for mm-hmm. many years. I'm sure. You know, to me, the difference between a good doctor and an average doctor is experience and using common sense, knowing when you need to do something and when you don't need to do something. Um, to me, in, in my medical practice and watching it for so many years. But so tell me, and I love the fact that it's, it's going to be understandable by the average person. You know, if I see a medical book that's that thick and doesn't have a whole lot of illustrations in it, then I kind of, you know, back off a little bit. But And I always underline the, the important points and all, and I'm going to do that with your book, and I'm certainly going to have it available in all my clinics, and everybody on this podcast will want to think about it because it's so important. You know, so many of our patients are women, and matter of fact, I got a call last week from a nurse practitioner friend of mine uh, asking me who's the best endocrinologist in our area that can talk to me and be open about treating my newfound osteoporosis. And I actually kind of had a hard time thinking about one that, number one, she could actually get into, number two, that would even entertain anything other than the bisphosphonates and, and medicines for it. So speak a little bit uh, on that, please. Yeah, well, and it is it is such a tough question to answer. And this is the question that we see over and over and over again, which is I got diagnosed, where do I find the right information? And in the traditional medical system, there isn't a great place to go because nobody wants to own it. You know, it is as an orthopedic surgeon, I obviously saw it, we treated the fractures, and then we would turn them over to their primary care doctor or whatever. And um, it, it was a big issue because they would come back and they would say, well, I, you know, nobody will talk to me about my osteoporosis. And then we'd send them to endocrinology and they'd come back and say, well, they didn't really talk to me about my osteoporosis and nobody wants to own it. Endocrinology, primary care, internal medicine, rheumatology, orthopedics, nobody wants it. 
And I think the reason why nobody wants it is because there isn't a great solution in the traditional medical model. We have drugs and we can talk about those drugs, but really what patients are looking for is the answer to the big question of why did I lose bone? Why did it, where did my skeleton go? And then how do I stop or reverse those causes of bone loss? And then is there something I can do naturally to help improve my bone? And that's exactly what we do in our practice is to answer those questions and to, to create a program built around that so that we can use all of the tools available, potentially including drugs, although not often, uh, but use all of the tools available of which there are so many that most people don't know about to put people on the path to improving their bone health. That is, I love that so much because you're exactly right. Nobody wants to own it. They want to kind of turf it off. And a lot of, a lot of being a primary care doc, I know I was taught, well, just put this patient on a bisphosphonate when they reach a certain number. It's almost like we're doing cookbook medicine and we're not giving the patient any natural options like bioidentical hormones, vitamin mm -hmm. D with K, exercise, you know, <laughs> weightlifting, those type of things. Right. I had a great discussion with Dr. Osborne, the neurosurgeon that got on my podcast a few weeks ago, um, talking about this very thing. And he, he's experienced the same kind of thing with neurosurgery, how to take care of your brain. But um, so I like that approach. Talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, who's at risk for osteoporosis? When should you start screening for this? Should you use a DEXA scan? And, you know, when do they need to start worrying about this? Not until they fall and break a hip, obviously. Yeah, that would be too late. Um, this, the, the, this is the crazy thing about osteoporosis. And one of the reasons why I ended up going down this pathway in my practice is that the more I thought about it, the more I just couldn't believe that we are where we are, or at least that we were where we were. Um, because when you look at the recommendations for screening, and this is by DEXA, and for those that aren't familiar with DEXA, DEXA is a, <clears throat> kind of a, a, like an X-ray that you lay on a big table and this big wand goes over you very slowly. And it's a very low radiation X-ray that tells you about your, your bone density, not quality, bone density um, and potentially body composition. Um, and that's a really important thing to understand. And we'll get to that later. But so let's say you, you, uh, you go to your doctor and you say, should I get a DEXA? The recommendations are not until you're 65 for women and 70 for men. And this is in the US. And that is way too late. Now I understand why, because you're most likely to catch the most people at those ages. So I get it from a, like a population health perspective, fine. But actually, if you want to reverse or stop or know early so you can prevent it, osteoporosis, you gotta know way before that. So the challenge is that those are the recommendations. So that's when Medicare will pay for it. That's when insurance companies will pay for it, except if you have one or more pre-existing risk factors. When you look at those lists of risk factors, it is crazy because everybody essentially falls into that category. So it's things like, you know, have you had excess stress in your life? Have you ever taken a PPI? Have you ever been on steroids for more than three days, including inhaled steroids? You know, have you ever lost a significant amount of weight? Do you have an eating disorder? And I'm like, check, 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 check. Like everybody could check off at least one of those boxes. That's a hundred percent of people. Yeah. So, so really we should all be, I think we should really know what our bone density is starting probably in our early adulthood, you know, at some point twenties and thirties, know what your peak bone mineral density is because that's going to really dictate how careful you have to be around some of these things that are going to end up causing significant bone loss over time. If you have a great starting point, it doesn't matter as much if you're putting yourself at risk for some of these things. But if you've got a really low starting point, it really matters because you, you don't have any room to, to lose. So it, I think we really should be screening probably in, in 20s and 30s, to be honest. Wow. Wow. So at the very latest, you know, when I see most of my patients, of course, I'm a baby boomer. I'm 68 years old. But I see a lot of younger people coming in, before, right, perimenopausal mm -hmm. or with low T. You know, my expertise really, what I love to deal with is obesity and hormonal problems, whether it be thyroid, whether it be cortisol, low T, uh, menopause with estrogen, progesterone, and those type of things. But yeah. so at least would you say by mid-40s people ought to start thinking about this, or is that even too late? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality is, is 
young adults in their twenties and thirties are not going to get a DEXA. I think that's just, unless they're getting it for body comp and then, and then maybe they'll see a T score. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, women, especially as they start getting close to this perimenopausal time, mid forties, really good time to know, because this conversation that you and I are having with patients about hormone replacement, we're having this conversation with every patient. We're talking risks and benefits with every patient. And, and this feeds into that, that risk benefit ratio. I just did a video for my YouTube channel on estrogen and, and bone loss. And, and it, it is such an important part of the conversation because women are so scared because of the, this dogma and fear around estrogen. And I tell them, look, if you have significant osteoporosis and you are at risk of fracture, let's worry about the devil you know rather than worry about the small percentage of the devil you don't know, right? Let's treat the thing that we know that you have an issue with, with the tools that we have, and then we can deal with the other things later because the risk is so small. It's not zero, but it's so small that, yeah, we really need to hop on this. And that age group is perfect. That, that perimenopausal early or late, late premenopausal, it's a lot of work there, but yes, that time period is perfect. And for men too, don't forget. Yeah, we, we forget about men a lot. And men come in to me with low T. They the need a DEXA scan to see where their bones are. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm always talking to people about gaining muscle, which I think you'll agree equates a lot to bone health. If you're building muscle, you're losing less bone, right? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know that that's absolutely linearly related, but yes, they are so closely related that you really can't talk about one without talking about the other. You know, it's interesting because uh, Dr. Osborne, uh, I have a machine sitting right here called an in-body machine. I, yeah. I, you probably know what I mean. So I've put I them do. in my Knoxville and my Tri-Cities location. And it's not a DEXA scan, but as far as muscle composition, water, excess water weight, dry bone mass, different musculatures, it's been great for me. I'm going to do a podcast on that very soon. But I use my in-body machine on every patient that comes in here. And you're right. Women are worried about estrogen really for a tiny fraction of a reason. All my new women patients, I end up talking to them about the fallacies of the, the WHI study right. from yep. 13, 15 years ago. And when they understand it, then they're not scared of estrogen because for them, that's when that estrogen starts dropping off. I mean, that's really when they accelerate their bone loss. Is that not correct? Absolutely. Yep. I mean, it's, it's just predictable. And that's what I tell women that are going through it. They say, well, I want to try without it. And I've said, that's, that's fine. But know that your loss of bone mass and other things is predictable when you lose estrogen. It is natural to lose estrogen. Totally true. Um, but what happens as a result of that natural process is predictable. That's really interesting. A lot of my patients um, come to me with a reasoning because they want to be holistic. They want to be yep. totally natural. Yep. And I, I pose this question to them. I go, well, you know, as we age, things decline a lot and we're, and we're living a long time. So if you want to live that second half of your life without hormones, you're going to, you're going to suffer the consequences. I mean, I liken it to, I ask them a question. I go, well, say, you, you know, as you get older, you can't see very well. Would you not want to wear glasses? Are you going to refuse to wear glasses because that's, that's right. not natural? Are you going to refuse to wear hearing aids because you can't hear because you're old? No, it's dumb. So same thing with hormones. But they're very safe. They do not cause breast cancer. And they, the benefits are so great that – and you need monitoring by somebody who knows what they're doing, obviously, right. and not many doctors do because they're not trained in, the, in right. hormone replacement. They're scared of it too because they're scared of getting sued. So, you know, you can't practice medicine out of fear. If you do, you're never really going to optimize that patient's health, in my opinion. Right. Yep. Yep. You're not going to. It's so hard. And I've, I've, you know, coming out of a surgical practice where ev everything you do is a potential lawsuit. Um, it's, it's interesting being in this space where, you know, I'm, I am comfortable being what some people would call aggressive. I don't think it's aggressive, but I'm comfortable intervening because I came from a, a past where all I did was intervene. I can't go back and say, Oh, no, I didn't do that surgery. <laughs> right? Like it's done. What's <laughs> done is done. And, um, and so in this space, I'm comfortable saying, having this conversation, this is the risk. This is the benefit. This is how I see the, the, the research. And I talk about the WHI almost every day. Um, and once you clear it up, you're right. People say, it and they say, Oh, you're right. I, I see, 
that there is this path with this tool and I want to give it a shot. And I don't know about you, but I'd love to hear your answer to this. Have you ever put a woman on appropriate doses of, of bioidentical hormones and not have them essentially just love it? Just love how it feels. You know, there, there's, there's one class of medicines that I've used in 38 years of practice that people come back and hug my neck, <laughs> man or woman, and it's always hormones. Yeah. It, it changes their life in a lot of ways. And in a lot of ways, too, I mean, because they feel better. But the other thing is they, it's doing work that they don't even realize, like for yeah. their bone health. I yeah. mean, you don't want to wait until you have a fracture. I mean, the mortality, if, if you're a woman who has a fracture, I mean, what's, what's the one year mortality on that person? Isn't it about 50 30%, 30%, yeah, 30%, 30%, 30%, 30%, if it's, if it's treated, um, and then that combines 30% overall, I'm sorry, 25% if it's treated and 90% one year mortality, if it's not. And wow. so, yeah, it, it, so, but that's, that's actually not the statistic that bothers me. I mean, yes, mortality bad, but the statistic that bothers me is actually that a third of patients with hip fractures never recover independence a third will require um, some kind of accommodation. Only a third recover some form of independence, but it's almost never the same as it was. Having a hip fracture is a life changer. Absolutely. Either a life ender or a life changer. And that's what people don't realize. They'll think, oh, I'll just, you know, if it happens, it happens and I'll move on. No, you won't. If you, if you do, you won't move on very quickly because it is, it is such a game changer. That is a profound statement. You know, let's talk a little bit about a little bit about men because I was playing pickleball yesterday, and I was playing with a guy about my age, and he has just gotten back on the courts because he fractured his fifth metatarsal playing pickleball. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that guy probably needs a bone scan, <laughs> wouldn't you think? Talk about <laughs> men. I mean, we hardly ever get yeah. them on mm -hmm. men. So it's funny. I just I did two recordings today. So one was on estrogen and bone health, and the second one was on men. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. So I, I find a disproportionate number of men in, in my practice, and it might just be because they're attracted to me as somebody to treat bone health. But I think that we are underselling both the prevalence of osteoporosis in men, meaning how many men actually have this problem. But I think what we're really underestimating is how many men are going to have this problem. Because like you said, we see low testosterone everywhere, right? Like it is so common in men. And for men, the only estrogen that they have, which we just talked about before, slows down bone loss. If you don't have testosterone, or if you have low testosterone, you have low estrogen as a man. And men need estrogen for a lot of things, but bone health is one of them. So I think we're going to see this cascade of osteoporosis and, and early osteoporotic fractures in men. And um, I, so I think it's coming. The other thing about men is that if you look statistically, even though they are about half as likely to have a fracture as women, they are um, disproportionately more likely to have a hip fracture, disproportionately more likely to die from a hip fracture, and disproportionately more likely to lose independence as a result of a hip fracture. So hip fractures are worse for men than they are for women. And I think we're going to start seeing them earlier and more often. That is really interesting. You know, I, I check an estradiol level on every man that I check a testosterone level on. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times if they're overweight, their estrogen levels are higher than their wife's. Yeah, I, mean, I know. It's, it's crazy, but they're aromatizing a lot of that. But yeah. most of them that have low T also have low uh, estradiol. And that's one reason people don't realize estradiol is very heart protective. It's not just mm -hmm. your bones, it's your heart, it's your brain. I mean, it's everything. So it's just as important in a man as a woman. It's just more evident in a woman. And in my practice, women come to the doctor more so than men do. Have you noticed that women are really smarter than men? Oh, absolutely. And I actually said this in, in the video. I think even in the title I put down, I was like, pay attention men or women who care about their men, <laughs> right? Because men are just not looking. They're not, they just, and I, and I'm guilty of this too. I mean, I don't, you know, do you have, do you have your own primary care doctor? I don't. Um, so we are, we're just not good about asking for help. We're not good about thinking that there's something wrong and about fixing it by asking for someone else to fix it for us. Right. It's just, right. it's just, we're just built in, like we're just warriors. And that's so, that's great. I love that about us, but we could serve our, our people, our families, our communities better if we are healthier, right? We can serve our mission better 
the more we can do. So I think sometimes we do need to pull our head out of our sand or wherever that head happens to be uh, and ask for help because um, we as men do not do a good job of that. I tell all my male patients that there's two people you really need to listen to in your life. <laughs> Number one, your mom. Number two, your wife. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that, that's universally true. Um, well, let's let's move on and talk about before we talk about the drugs that we may have to use for a few patients. What are the best natural ways to keep your bone intact? Yeah. So I, I look at this from a, a um, framework perspective. We actually pulled this out of our health optimization practice, but we call it our optimization pyramid. And so we start with the foundational stuff. So this is the stuff you talk about with all your patients, right? So this is sleep, nutrition, exercise, and either stress or spiritual connection, whatever you want to call that. Um, and we go into this in, in a lot of depth. So we have coaches that'll work with this. We do functional testing on gut health. We are really trying to push this group because they get such bad information, but we're trying to push this group into an, an adequate protein, animal protein forward diet that is limited in all the stuff that we know is bad for us, but just seems to permeate this group of, of patients. So really changing diet intensively and then starting with the exercise part, getting them to realize that walking is not enough. It's good, but it's not enough. Um, and we have to start doing some resistance training. We've got to load the bones. We've got to build muscle mass. You've got to make that anabolic switch, which if you know patients with osteoporosis, you know that they don't really look like they're anabolic, right? They're, they just look like they're in this like chronic, subtle catabolic state. And that's not how you build bone and muscle mass. Yeah. So, so we start there and then we talk about targeted based off of biomarker supplementation, um, and then we talk about hormones and then we talk about peptides and then, and only then do we have a discussion about drugs. And by the time we get there, we generally don't need them. I agree a hundred percent. It's always, I love your framework and the way you approach that for sure. But you're right. You need to build muscle because so many of my patients that are my age are really sarcopenic. They have no muscle. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I got my in body machine to measure their muscle. It's very yeah. telling. Watch it over time. Yeah. yeah. Watch it over time and see if we can do some interventions <clears throat> that help. You know, like Dr. Osborne says, we build our our muscles from the capsule out. You know, we need to think about our ligaments, our tendons and their capsules because mm. otherwise your muscles are not going to respond. They're going to yeah. or, or you can have an injury. You're going to get injured. Yeah. And that's what my number one rule for my patients. And I have big, bold letters in my book. Don't get injured. It takes too long to recover. Don't get injured. Um, but it, it's tough. And this is why we actually have one-on-one -on -one coaching from an exercise perspective, because it's really hard to know where to start, how much to lift. And these patients with, that have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, they are scared to lift, right? They've been told, don't lift more than three pounds. You're going to break your back. Yeah. But a yeah. lot of times these are people that, that came from a very active lifestyle and all of a sudden they're like, nope, I can't lift anything. That's yeah. not going to make you better, right? It's going to make you worse, faster. I That's, tell people that, you, you know, because I like the deadlift. To me, that maybe the squat, but the deadlift and the squat are up there <laughs> in my importance of your health. <laughs> and I tell them, they say, I can't deadlift because I have a bad back. And I go, you have a bad back because you're not deadlifting. <laughs> you can't deadlift. Yeah. Don't you you have to deadlift because you have a bad back. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. tough. No, I do it. I do it every week. I've got a, a, a deadlift day and oh man, it is tough. I didn't start doing that until just probably two years ago. And I'm terrible at it compared to where I should be. I'm going to have a podcast by a couple of physical therapists that I work a lot with about technique on deadlift. But they mm. actually have some of my 90 year old patients deadlifting a little bit to me that's very important i like to watch a person get out of their chair or get out of the floor without using their arms yeah we actually try to teach them that you know we right. measure their grip strength or do we do their in body analysis and make them get in the floor with our nutritionist physical therapist and can you get out of the floor and if they can't which a lot of times they can't, they can't. right and yep. they're in trouble, right? Yep. Yep. They, they will. So it's this whole combination of like sarcopenia, osteoporosis, and then inability to protect yourself in a fall, right? That that's a combination for a hip fracture. I mean, just it's so it's so simple, but it happens so quickly. And I know you and I, we both talk about about Peter Atia and his 
uh, his content and information. And one of the things he talks about in, in his centenarian decathlon is maintaining the ability to get, I think he says with one hand, um, but the ability to get up off the floor with one hand, essentially with the idea that you could be holding on to something as you get up like a small child. Um, and it is, it's important and it does go away very quickly. You know, he does a demonstration on a little two minute clip on how to get up from the floor with one hand and then by yourself. You know, some people are not going to be able to do it without using one hand, but he has, he has a girl demonstrating this and it's wonderful. You could probably YouTube it and yeah. see it, but it's yeah. really wonderful. Um, but, uh, well, so you do the natural stuff and then what about medications? Everybody asked me about yeah. medications. I'm not, yeah. I haven't been fond of the bisphosphonates since they came out because yeah. the technique on when you swallowed them, you had to stay upright. You could have severe heartburn with it. it and now they have bad, injectables. It? Yeah. It just sounds like you're like, here, here, follow this pill, but don't lay down, don't lay down. And, and you might feel like you want to, but don't lay down. Yeah. So I, I, I looked into this in a lot of depth. I, when I was in orthopedic practice, I helped my PA at the time, Clayton LeBalm, great, great guy, great PA in, in Durango, Colorado. And uh, he created a fracture liaison service. So I got introduced to this while I was still practicing. And it, it is a traditional insurance based, let's, you know, evaluate you for fracture risk and provide, provide meds when necessary. And so I learned about the meds at that point, but I never really looked into them. I kind of just let him take it. Um, but I never really looked into them until I got to this place and I had to start making this decision on my own of when do we actually need to take the meds? And for me, it's all about fracture risk. And I already mentioned too, knowing why you're losing bone. And I mentioned DEXA, I didn't mention the biomarkers that we use. We use two different biomarkers, CTX and P1 and P, which will tell you are you rapidly losing bone, CTX, or are you not building bone, a low P1 and P? And so for me, if I'm considering drug therapy, I want to know, are you rapidly losing bone or are you just not building bone? This phosphonates are drugs that will slow down bone loss. So if you're not rapidly losing bone and you take a bisphosphonate, guess what? You're not really going to get any better. Um, also, bisphosphonates, prolia, even avenity to some extent, they squash bone metabolism, just like crush it. And if you crush bone metabolism, you're going to end up with complications. And that's what we see with these drugs. They are not common, but they are common enough that I really don't like the drugs. And those things are osteonecrosis of the jaw, terrible complication, um, and atypical femur fracture, which is even more rare, but basically just a complication of essentially not being able to turn over bone. So if I need to use a drug, and in my practice, I don't have people that are, are rapidly losing bone from, say, like cancer treatments and chemotherapy. That's a, kind of a different conversation. But for my practice, most of the patients I see are not necessarily rapidly losing bone, or we can capture that with estrogen therapy, hopefully. Um, but what I see is people that are just not building bone. And if they're on bisphosphonates, their P1 and P is like zero. I mean, just like nothing. Nothing's happening. So then if we need to, if somebody is at really high fracture risk, say a T-score of, you know, negative four, negative five, right? Like these are people with like impending doom fracture. Um, then we would use an anabolic, Forteo and Timlos. They don't squash bone metabolism. They really elevate the, the bone building side. Compare that, you know, with all the other drugs. And I find that the risk benefit ratio is, is really beneficial for those drugs. But you, have, you can only use them for a short period of time. They're hard to get insurance to approve them. Um, but then you have to have a plan on the other side. So it's not a once and done. You can only use them for two years and you have to have a plan on the other side. So for me, this is a crutch to help get somebody pushed in the right direction, but then we still need to build the plan around it. The drug companies would say, well, you need to go on reclass or a bisphosphonate after you go on a, a drug like Forte or Temlos. And that might be true to prevent that loss of bone. But I think that if you can build a solid bone program, and you're going to have everything in place by the time you come off that drug in one to two years, then I bet you don't. That is a great plan. I've never heard that plan before. I knew you could only use them for a couple of years and I agree they're to me, they're better than the bisphosphonates, but that is a really good plan. Now, what about, um, when you talk about some of these things, what, what about when you've operated on these people that have been on bisphosphonates? You told me before that their bone is different, right? In what way? <laughs> so sometimes it literally feels like marshmallow. And this is, I mean, it's, it's scary. 
but sometimes it literally feels like, uh, so, you know, we're like you mentioned, putting in rods and, and pens and stuff. So when you're driving a screw into bone, especially in the femur, it should feel like the hardest wood you've ever driven a screw into. If you've ever done that, right. It should feel like a hardwood. I don't know what a hardwood is like a maple or something. You know, I don't know. I'm not a carpenter. Um, but in an osteoporotic bone, it can literally feel like an eggshell and marshmallow. And you know, when you feel that, then you're in trouble because no implant in the world is going to withstand not having any structural strength in the bone. They also take so long to heal, especially if they're on bisphosphonates take so long to heal that, you know, you're in a race with your implant structural integrity. Is the implant going to break before this bone heals? And the answer is maybe, you know, likely. That is interesting. Are you telling me you would never really want to use a bisphosphonate at all anymore? I wish I could say that, but that's not really true. So in, in my patient population, that's generally true. Um, but there are cases. And so this, this is the circumstance that I see where this becomes a different equation, which is say a woman has breast cancer. She's on a Remedex, They're blocking estrogen. She's rapidly losing bone because she's going through essentially an early menopause, right? So just like shutting down all sex hormone function, but it's temporary, right? Plan is to go on, you know, she's had a mastectomy. She's on a Remedex. They're preventing it maybe, maybe for two years or five years. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an oncologist. I don't know how this works, but I know that they usually don't do it forever. Right. And so possibly going on a drug that's going to prevent that rapid bone loss while they're in a situation where there's another drug for a, a potentially more likely reason to kill you uh, thing that is going to be pushing you in that direction. So you're really just using pharmaceutical to, to battle pharmaceutical, but it's temporary. That I think is the right reason to use a bisphosphonate. Um, and there are a lot of indications in that same kind of realm, but that's the most common one that I hear. And I hear it all the time. That is really interesting. I love your perspective on that particular situation. It just reminds me how, you know, medicine is much as, as of an art as a science because mm -hmm. everybody's different and you've got to consider a lot of different things when you're treating these things. Um, yeah. just like when you use testosterone, you know, I use testosterone pellets in women that are past their breast cancer because I think it helps them in a lot of ways. And certainly I keep an eye on all their hormones still, but certainly that's one hormone that women need just like men do just a lot lower dose of it. And, you know, I think that's very helpful for them in a lot of ways. Uh, but that is interesting. So there are certain cases where you would use a bisphosphonate maybe to counter the effects of an anti-estrogen drug in breast mm -hmm. cancer to balance it out. So in other words, you've got plans for all these different situations <laughs> for women. I, I love that because you it's really kind need of the to. Way my, it's the way my brain works, which is both good and bad because it means that my brain is always trying to find an answer to a problem that I don't already have. <laughs> so it's tiring. It's exhausting. Uh, but yeah, it is good for my patients. Well, that means you're a good doctor in my, in my book. Um, so tell me about this book. You know, we really need to promote it. When does yeah. it come out? Isn't it next week or so it comes out. Uh, so September, uh, what is, what's the, the holiday is on the fifth. So the sixth, Labor day, maybe the fourth, hold on. Okay. I got a calendar. Labor day. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the day after Labor day, uh, which, uh, I believe is the, um, Oh, I don't even have the right day. Anyway, it's next week on Tuesday, the 5th. There we go. I found it. So on the 5th, it comes out. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really excited about it. Again, it is basically my, my kickstart guide. Good for anybody that is recently diagnosed, has questions about all the stuff that we just talked about. Hormones, um, exercise, supplements, uh, nutrition. I have this whole kind of controversial nutrition section in there. Um and kind of go through the drug thing. And then I talk about our approach and I talk about you know, this framework that we talked about. It's an easy read. I think really anybody that has a diagnosis should read it because what I see out there as I've started to create this YouTube channel and all of this content is that uh, there is so much misguided information in my opinion, uh, misguided, misdirected, especially around nutrition and exercise, this really unnecessary fear and anxiety that goes along with this diagnosis that just doesn't need to be there. So please anybody that knows somebody it's this book is inexpensive easy read i i really wish uh, that people would get it out there and again it's called the osteoporosis breakthrough um and um 
Yeah. I'm, uh, Dr. I'm Doug about. Lucas, I cannot wait to read it. I can't wait to distribute it, tell everybody about it and spread the word because I just love your approach to, to medicine in general, much less osteoporosis. You know, we have all these women that come to us. I just, I just got the scare of my life. I got a DEXA scan. I have osteopenia. I'm thinking <laughs> everybody, every woman has osteopenia that's you know, over 50. So don't <clears throat> yeah. freak out about this. You don't know? lose sleep over that one. And, that, and that's a, such an important lesson too. I mean, I have patients that, that actually people that will call, call my office and schedule an appointment. And I've had to train my team on this. And they say, you know, oh my gosh, my, I, have a, I have osteopenia and I have a T-score of, of you know, negative 1.6. You know, and, and, and I'm like, you know, look, don't, don't just, no, they don't, they don't need this. Maybe they need health optimization, you know, and we'll talk about that, but, but they don't need our program, you know, and literally, literally turning people away be like, look, just, this is normal. Like, and actually show them on the, cause you show them the T-score chart. Osteopenia is normal at a certain age, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't remember it's like sixties, but it's normal. And like, I have osteopenia and I'm not worried about my fracture risk, right? Um, so yeah, this is, this is, this, this really great educational opportunity to tell people that that is not a problem. I mean, it can be, if you are, we back that up. If you have osteopenia and you are getting worse quickly, that's a problem that you should address. Cause it's much easier to slow down bone loss and to, to start from there than it is to start from, you know, a T score of negative five. So don't ignore it, but don't lose sleep over it. Just understand what it is and, and let's figure out, you know, monitor it and treat it if needed. How often should those people get a bone, a DEXA scan? I, I would do it minimum yearly. It kind of depends on what's happening. You know, you're not going to see big changes in DEXA year to year. For the most part, women around menopause, you, you know, maybe maybe more often. Um, but that's where I like to use this ultrasound device called a REMS by this company, Echolite. The closest yeah. one to you guys in, in Tennessee is actually in Asheville. There are not very many of these devices, but it's a, I feel probably a better test for um, bone density. And it also talks about bone fragility. So it talks, it has a fragility score associated with it. It's an ultrasound. It's, uh, my friend, uh, Mike Lewin, he's a, uh, uh, chiropractor in Asheville has, has one in actually in black mountain, but just down the road. And so that's, that's an area where people could do that more frequently because there's no radiation, right? Yeah. It's easy. Now what's that called? Because I'm going to write this down. Yeah. It's called an echo light. That's echo E C H O light. I don't know if there's a GH in there. Um, and then REMS, R-E-M-S. And it's, um, again, it's an ultrasound. It's out of um, Switzerland, I think. I could see me wrong about That's that. Really um, yeah, but it's it's a cool device, but it's not covered by insurance. And there, again, there just aren't very many. But if you have access to it, then it's a cool thing to get. Usually if it's not covered by insurance, that means you need it, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> what are, so, and there's a couple blood tests that you like to follow. I'm going to write these mm -hmm. down too. Yeah. I'm not doing so this. CTX or C telepeptide, uh, that's a blood test. That's, it's a newer version of an old test called NTX, um, which it used oh, to be a yeah. urine test, kind of looking at the same thing. Yeah. Um, and this is osteoclast function. And then there's P1NP, which is, uh, I'm not even going to try to remember what that stands for, but P1NP is the osteoblast function. Um, and that if you look at those two and you monitor those over time, for me, it kind of substitutes for DEXA because those are gonna change on a, on a weekly basis. Um, and then DEXA, you just don't need to do that often. So I monitor those to help us to determine, to determine how our program is going. You know, is your CTX coming down? Is your P1 and P going up? You know, what do we need to do to help push these things in the right direction? So that gives me a lot of confidence that we're doing the right thing. That is awesome. Well, I've certainly got a great education here today, and I'm pumped about your book. Congratulations. That's a lot of work. Um, I'm sure we're going to keep in contact, oh, yeah. um, and I hope to do more uh, podcasts with you in the future. Good luck on not only your practice, but your new book, and uh, tell your lovely wife, hi, she's amazing. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, PhD Weight Loss is an amazing program, and go, go look at our podcast with her as well. Um, just amazing. So keep up the good work doctor Thanks, and we'll see you next time okay sounds good appreciate it thank you